seek most of all is a true partnership between the United States and Africa. Too often, African nations have been treated as instruments, as instruments of other nations' of other progress, nations progress rather than, rather than the others of, of their own. Time and again, Time and again they have been told they to been told pick to a side pick in the great, great power contests that feel far removed from the far really struggles, of their, struggles of their people. The United States, the United will, States not will not dictate Africa's, Africa's choices. Africa's choices. That's U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken on a three-country tour in Africa this week, telling African officials that the U.S. will not dictate the decisions that African governments make, particularly as it relates to the conflict in Ukraine. But it looks like there are indications otherwise, which appears to be why Blinken visited the continent just weeks after Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov was there, telling African countries that they have the right to their sovereignty. Joining me today to to discuss this issue is Didier Gondola, African professor, African history professor at Johns Hopkins University, and Telama Miabe, president of the National Congress for Democracy. Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining me. I am so glad that this issue of HR 7311, which is what we're going to talk about today, which is an indication that in fact the U.S. is not allowing African governments and the African diaspora to make their decisions uh, about things that relate to the conflict in Ukraine. So first of all, I just want to get you guys' initial reactions to what we heard the Secretary of State say as he was visiting the continent today. Didier, I'll start with you. Well, Hermela, thank you for inviting me to your program. I am really happy to connect uh, with your followers and uh, with your netizens. Uh, so my initial reaction to what Anthony Blinken said, I know that he toured three African countries, as you said, he first went to South Africa, where he actually met with some resistance, and then he was on his way to the DRC, and then next uh, up was Rwanda. I, I think that we have to make a distinction between what politicians say, uh, and then those are lofty words, they are lofty principles, and, and I really like the fact that the U.S., um, actually position is softening a little bit, at least in public, the public position. But what matters most to us is really what is done behind the scene. And I hope that behind the scene is not going to be uh, business as usual. Uh, it's not going to be kind of a, a, total, a total contrast uh, compared to what, what, what is said. So I, I really like the, the new tone. I really like the fact that, yes, uh, the U.S. will not dictate Africa, uh, its policies, because the African countries are sovereign nations. Uh, they are entitled to their own policies, to create their own policies, to have their own ambitions, and uh, to actually protect their own interests. And, and I like what I heard, but my concern is that, is it going to be actually followed by deeds? So you have some optimism. Uh, I'm curious, Taylama, what, what did you get out of uh, hearing what the Secretary of State said? Well, first of all, also, I want to say thank you to you and uh, for inviting me and uh, for the great work you're doing for not only, I guess, for the Ethiopian community, but also the fact that uh, you've been uh, very active in bringing uh, Africans together and having an approach with the normal movement and bringing uh, continental Africans uh, uh, all together. So I think you're doing a fantastic job and continue that way. Uh, I will be a little bit more... Uh, skeptical than, than Didier uh, because I am a, I'm a practical person and I want to see actions. I just don't want to see words. Uh, the continent of Africa has suffered enough. Uh, the continent of Africa is going through some tremendous um, uh, difficult experiences. We have suffered uh, too long and uh, I think that, um, you know, we have to give them the benefit of the doubt, but Let's see concretely what they are going to do. We have some very serious problem on the continent of Africa that need to be addressed. Uh, President uh, Joe Biden claimed that this is uh, the mandate between um, uh, autocracy and democracy. We have a very strong uh, autocracy uh, countries on the continent of Africa where abuses are taking place. Um, I think this dialogue of talking about sovereignty of a nation. Uh, we also have to take in consideration that uh, so many African countries uh, has, have dictators in position of power. Uh, and all those issues, we have to take them in consideration. And what the U.S. is going to do, uh, we want to see in practice, not just by words. 
So I'm a little skeptical and I want to see what they be able, they're going to be able to do practically. Right. And I mean, that kind of leads us to the issue of U.S. House Bill H.R. 7311. I mean, it's, it's great that Secretary Blinken uh, is saying these things. I mean, it, it's on one hand, it, it feels a little ridiculous that it has to be said that African countries are sovereign countries. On the other hand, it's good that we're saying it right. We're no longer dancing around the issue. And it sort of admits and suggests that they weren't treated that way before. And I guess the question that we all have is what it will look like moving forward. So when Secretary Blinken was in uh, uh, Africa, he visited three countries, South Africa was one of them. Uh, and I discovered the, the South African international relations minister uh, as a character that was particularly strong in the way that she spoke up about the sovereignty of African countries. And she actually brought up this U.S. House Bill 7311, which did quietly pass the House. Um, and it seems to be doing exactly the opposite of what Secretary Blinken says the U.S.'s stance is um, on the sovereignty of African countries. So I want to play uh, a little bit of the uh, South African international relations minister, Naledi Pandor, and what she said while sitting next to Blinken, and then we'll discuss. I'm glad uh, that uh, uh, Secretary Blinken has confirmed that America is not asking us to choose. I don't recall uh, any attempt by the United States to do that. But in terms of our interaction with some of our partners in Europe and elsewhere, there has been a sense of a patronizing bullying uh, toward you choose this or else. Uh, and uh, the recent uh, legislation passed in the United States of America uh, by the House of Representatives, we found a most unfortunate bill uh, that we'd hope the media would say more about because uh, when we believe in freedom, as I'm saying, it's freedom for everybody. You can't say because Africa is doing this, you will then be punished by the United States. So uh, that's been a that's disappointing, been a disappointing uh, 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 passage, uh, of passage of legislation, legislation by, one by one house, and we hope the and other house the other will house not agree to, to uh, such, offensive such offensive legislation. legislation. So like I mentioned, 7311 quietly passed the house. Uh, you know, a lot of us was actually were actually paying attention to it when it first uh, sort of came to our attention, but then we didn't even catch the fact that it passed the House. It just kind of happened under the radar. Taylama, I want to start with you because I know you sort of initiated a petition against that particular 7311 uh, bill. Reading it, what did what what came to mind? Well, I think it's uh, it's precisely what is wrong with. Uh, uh, people who have been interacting with the continent of Africa for centuries. Uh, there's a construct that has taken place in the history uh, of Africa. And um, as we, we are trying to make a sense of the House Resolution 7311, I think it's essential for us to, um, to briefly revisit the social construct that originated on, in the infantilizations of, of black, the black race. Uh, in recent history, around the 18th, 19th century, uh, the European uh, constructed, uh, painted, polluted a narrative that was uh, destructive to the African continent by infantilizing Africans, denying the, them as a mature people, as a human being. In fact, uh, that, that narrative that was constructed in the 18th, 19th century uh, 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 Africa has suffered and we continue to suffer of it today where we are perceived as lot of children and um, what the treatment that has been applied to the Africans is basically that and so what you see in that resolution is basically an expression of those thought process that took place in the 18th century ideology that was constructed, uh, the infantilization of Africans that was constructed by um, philosopher like Hegel, uh, German philosopher of the 19th century, father of one of the father of the modern philosophy, who basically described Africa as um, as children. In fact, in his, in his book called *Reason in History*. Hegel stated the following as he talks about Africa. He says, this is the land where men are children, a land lying beyond the daylight of self-conscious history, an envelope of the black colors of night. 
He says, at this point, let us forget Africa, not to mention it again, for Africa is not an historical part of the world. So the social construct, right, was done in the 18th century. I mean, there are other uh, philosopher, writer, explorer we can, we can quote, but they're all turning around the idea that Africans are children. And so throughout history, that idea has been um, established and it is basically part of what we're dealing today. When the House passed a resolution telling us that you Africans, we, you have to listen what we tell you. If you don't listen what we tell you, we will punish you, we will sanction you. Basically what they're saying, they're talking to us like we are little children. That is the language we use to talk to kids. And precisely, they view us as children. And so that needs to stop because that has been at the essence of the wrongdoing that has taken place for the African continent. And there has to be a time when we need to stand to put an end to uh, the destruction and the ideology that has been at the essence of the destruction of the African people. I've been all little long, but I'll come back to some of the points that I want to make on this, on, this, on this idea. I think, you know, to your point uh, of, of this sort of infantilizing uh, the, the uh, people of the African continent as well as the African diaspora, when you look at the bill, in many places, I saw 12 different places where it, call, it talked about influence. It was concerned about the influence of people on the African continent and in the, in the African diaspora. Uh, and then also talked about people on the African continent and the diaspora manipulating people's opinions on what's going on uh, in Ukraine as if you cannot just take in information and make a decision uh, on your own. So I want to pull out a couple of things in Didier. I want to I want to hear a little bit more about what you think about this bill. Uh, so it, HR 7311 says it wants to hold, it, it's titled Countering Malign Russian Activities in Africa mm -hmm. Act. Mm -hmm. So why? Why is there this focus on Africa? I'm not aware of any other continent that's being uh, talked about in this context. To hold accountable the Russian Federation and African government and their officials who are complicit in aiding such malign influence and activities. What does it mean, malign activities? What does it mean to aid? And why is the focus on Africa, Didier? Well, um, Telema actually took the longer view. Uh, I, I was thinking that he would leave that to the historian that I was. So he kind of stole my thunder. <laughs> and that's OK by actually taking the discussion all the way to the 18th century. With by, those, it, by the way, he's my teacher, history no, teacher. I am not yeah, that's okay. I'm a good yeah, teacher. The teacher became the master, huh? So, yeah, absolutely. So that actually means that I'm a good teacher. So Hermela, um, malign is something, malign in Africa, we cannot actually put Russia in the mix. Uh, there are other countries that we can actually put in the mix, a place like France, for example, which has um, in, in the past for several centuries, some really malign activities in Africa, uh, exploiting, pillaging African resources, um, you know, making sure that African cannot actually choose their leaders, replacing the father with the son. They've done that in several countries very recently. They did that in Gabon. Um, by replacing Omar Bongo with his son. They did that in Togo with, uh, with Eya Dema. They did that in Chad with Idris Deby, uh, partly in, in Congo DRC with uh, Kabila the father and Kabila the son. They are actually preparing to do that in the Republic of Congo by replacing Sasunge so with his son. So if we are really talking about a specific country that has had malign activities in uh, in, in Africa, Russia wouldn't actually come to mind. It would be it would be France. I'd like to go back to the genesis, if you allow me, the genesis of this bill. To me, it's so really interesting that this bill was passed on April the 28th of this year, and it was actually sponsored by 17 people. It was a very bipartisan resolution with, uh, I think, uh, five Republicans and 12 Democrats. So if you look at the Democrats that actually, the person who, sponsored, who who introduced the bill is 
Christopher Meeks, I think he's a representative of the fifth district of New York. He's part of the Black Caucus. If you look at the, the other Democrats that actually sponsored the bill, co-sponsored the bill, many of them are, are actually part of the Black Caucus. And it's so ironical that Meeks said that the purpose of this bill was to protect Africa. You know, Africa needs protection. And to me, it's so ironic, so interesting that they use the U.S. Congress Black Caucus to pass a bill, a resolution that's so detrimental to Africa. Isn't that interesting? Another part of this bill that's so fascinating, uh, it took only 40 minutes to debate the bill on the floor of the U.S. Congress. 40 minutes for such an important bill just 40 minutes. Very, very interesting. And um, I think that I have to remind your readers, uh, your, your followers, uh, your netizens, that one of the reasons that the bill was passed is that there were two votes uh, at the General Assembly of the UN. One vote was on March the 2nd. The other vote was on April the 7th. The, 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 the April the 7th actually was meant to exclude uh, Russia from the UN uh, Council on Human Rights, which actually was done. You, you look at the people, the countries that abstain, it's not just African countries. It's a lot of Asian countries that are also abstained. We have China, we have Bangladesh, we have Armenia, we have Iran and Iraq, we have Vietnam, we have, uh, we have Pakistan, we have so many Asian countries, but yet we do not have a bill targeting those Asian countries. So the question that we have left with to really ponder is why Africa? And I think that going back to what Telama said is this kind of infantilization. Africa is a different continent. It's a continent that we can bully. It's a continent that we can mistreat, we can pillage. And I think it's really time to stop. It's really time for that narrative, that social construct that uh, Telama so eloquently uh, uh, articulated, it's time for that construct to stop. Yes, and you know, the, the, the thing that I'm realizing and I would like other people who are not from the African continent or don't have connections there is these kind of bills go against what we all agree it means to be America, at least or Americans, and at least in terms of the ideals. So having the freedom of a speech when it comes to a conflict that the U.S. is involved in that is affecting Americans in so many different ways, why you cannot take part in that conversation, mm -hmm. whatever it is that you think is un-American, but because... Wow. And this is just sort of a perspective, not so much a fact, but because it is a bill that's targeting the African continent, a lot of people turn a blind eye to it because they don't connect to it. I mean, in general, Africa is one of the most exploited places in the world, if not the most exploited place. And even in the most conscious uh, room, sometimes you'll find people that just assume that Africa is just sort of inherently poor and that it's not mm -hmm. because of all of this different intervention that happens from the outside that is arming uh, opposition groups, which the uh, uh, South African um, minister did mention. And I was really just happy to hear her say the things that we all knew to be true out loud with the U.S. Secretary of State right next to her, which really gives the United States policymakers a chance to correct course or continue to go down the path and lose a continent of, of over a billion people, many of whom are young, a continent that is uh, rich in resources. So I try to encourage folks that are not from the continent to really just think more critically about what your views are on Africa and why they may not be um, you know, why Why it may be like any other place that has had intervention, and that's why there's this perception that Africa is poor and always at war. If we're all more uh, involved in asking the questions as to why, then we'll find that it's very similar to what happens everywhere else. And mm -hmm. these kind of bills should scare Americans, because I'm an American, I just happen to have roots in Africa, and that's true for many of us. So let's pull up a couple of things. I want to hear um, what you guys thought about other parts of um, uh, the bill here. Uh, it talks about holding at the African diaspora or anyone who influences the African diaspora, again, U.S. citizens in many cases, accountable. So it says, uh, anyone who manipulates African governments and their policies, as well as the public opinions and voting preferences of African populations and diaspora groups, including those in the United States. 
Hey, Lama, uh, when you read that, I thought that was one of the most eerie um, elements. When you read that, what were your uh, first thoughts? That it once again is, uh, is the sense that we are being told what to do. We are children. They will not talk like this to any other groups but us. And I want to go back to some of this point that Didi just uh, mentioned. Uh, when we talk about Russia, malevolent, right? Russia, uh, malign, to whom? Malevolent to whom? Do African countries, African people do not know what is good for themselves? They have to be told by Europeans about America what is good for themselves? That is really a concern for me. For, for what, as I'm looking at the continent of Africa, Raj, the fundamental question that I'm asking to myself and as I read this uh, resolution is that who is really the malevolent power on the continent of Africa? Didier just mentioned that, talked about it, but I want to go to a deeper extent to it. First of all, it's important for me to state that I am not a pro-Russia. In fact, I'm an American citizen, as you said, who has root on the continent of Africa, and I believe in the values of justice, equality, the pursuit of happiness, democracy, and all the values that have made America a great country. Therefore, I'm not choosing for any side here except that I'm looking for I'm looking at for the betterment of the continent of Africa that has been abused. The one thing I want to remind people here is this. Russia has never colonized a single African country. Russia did not sustain a neo-colonial influence, right, on the continent of Africa. To the contrary, Russia has helped some of the African countries to get their independence. Russia did not sign a colonial pact, right, with its former colony in Africa to keep those colony in bondage even after so-called independence. Russia did not participate in the elimination or assassination of leaders that were considered, African leaders that were considered too bright, right, too independent-minded, by the, in the mind of the former colonial power. Russia does not maintain 14 African countries today that are paying 50% of the foreign currency reserves. 50% of the foreign currency reserve. Right now, there are 14 African countries. When they sell oil, right, for a billion dollars, half of that money have to be placed in some foreign bank, and I'm going to tell the name, the French mm -hmm. bank, the central French bank, half of the money. It used to be 100% before, and that was established by the colonial pact. We remember leaders, President like Sekuture from Guinea, who when he was given the choice between to continue to be under the French influence, who he felt like it was under slavery, he stated the following. We prefer freedom to poverty to, I'm sorry, we prefer freedom in poverty to opulence in slavery. And then what did the French did at that time? They basically attempted military coup against him to remove it. And they flooded his economy by fake currency in the country. I'm going to give you a few names of people, leaders of the country of Africa that were visionary but all of them have been eliminated. I take Sylvanius Sil uh, Olympio, first president of Togo. David Dako, first president of Central Africa Republic. Maurice Mayemgo, first president of Burkina Faso, which was Alt Volta at the time. Modiba Keita, first president of Mali. Uber Menga, first president of Benin. All those leaders were removed by ex-French legionnaire because they didn't agree with some of the colonial policy French was trying to put on these African countries. In fact, Silverlitz Olympia, who was a brilliant economist, was killed three days after his country decided to build, to create its own currency. So what I'm trying to be saying, what I'm simply saying to you is this. If there is a nation that has been 
malib, uh, malevolent, malign is not Russia. It is France. And as you remember, when we met you and I uh, during that meeting we had with Karen Bass, this is one of the comments that I made to Ms. Bass, was that if you really want to protect Africa, there's a particular nation that has been the most destructive, the most malevolent, predatory uh, nation on the continent of Africa, and that is France. But here's what was the answer. Oh, we cannot pass a resolution against France. Why not? The African leaders, African young men today, as you said, we're, we're going to become the youngest population on the continent. 70 in, in 2050, 70 percent of those who are going to be less than 25 will be on the continent of Africa. Our continent is rich and has a, a lot of young people. We need to guide them properly as we're dealing with there's a new scramble on the continent of Africa. And some of our leaders have gone to the U.S. They've, they have attempted to reach out to the U.S. to say, hey, we want to work with you. We want to stand on your side. But here's what they told us. The U.S. said, well, we cannot go against the French because you guys were colonized by the French. So therefore, we don't want to infuriate the French. So what is the choice of the African continent that is trying to free itself from bondage, from centuries of bondage, right? We have to continue to die. We have to continue to be killed so French people can have the dress, they can have the, the cheese and croissant in the Champs-Élysées. How many African children will have will continue to die for us to be free from the grip of colonization that the French have imposed on us? France is, has never left the continent of Africa. They are still there, destructive. And the U.S. now is telling us we cannot go to Russia, we cannot work with, uh, with China because they have malevolent interest. Come on, that needs to stop. And you and I, us members of the African diaspora, we have a say on what needs to be done. I just want to stop there for now. Yes, and you know it's so it's so crazy that while this conversation is happening, first of all, I'm sure there's somebody out there that thinks that we were influenced by somebody to have our opinions. Second, I I was looking at YouTube. I just happened to come across its um, its rules, and in March 2022, again something that kind of went by. There were rules about issues that were influencing. Um, they didn't use that word, but it suggested influencing any opinions on the conflict in Ukraine and Russia. So I'm literally thinking about, is this going to get censored? Which is such a mm -hmm. crazy thing to think while you're in the United States on some issue like this. Uh, the other thing I'm glad, Taylama, you brought up is um, that meeting that we had with Congresswoman Karen Bass, uh, who's a congressperson here in California and was on the House Fair Foreign Relations Committee, but now she's running uh, for LA mayor. And I remember that conversation and you brought up 7311 and she actually didn't know about it. And at the time I didn't realize she was a co-sponsor wow. and she didn't realize that her name was on that or she was pretending either way. But mm. I, I, I tend to believe that she really didn't know, mm. you know, their names are being put on things. And, and it really goes back to uh, you know, I think Didier, you were bringing up that uh, 7311 is authored, is uh, sponsored. The the primary sponsor is Congressman uh, Gregory Meeks out of New York, a black congressperson. Um, and there tends to be that pattern of using black folks here in the United States exactly. to push certain policies on mm -hmm. the African continent. They did it with the U.S. ambassador uh, to the U.N., uh, Linda Greenfield, I believe her last name is. I mm -hmm. might be. Mm -hmm. yep. She went out and said, all, all you guys can buy is fertilizer and food. Otherwise, there are sanctions. So, you know, as an African history professor, Didier, like, what do you, how do you see this sort of new tactic? Or maybe it's not so new, you know, but how do you see this, this tactic of using African Americans here in the United States, some of whom, like you said, are on the uh, Congressional Black Caucus? Uh, to push these kind of colonial-like policies. Yeah. I think it really saddens me um, because, you know, I know for a fact that um, African-American civil rights leaders back in the 1960s were actually galvanized by issues um, affecting Africa. Uh, one of the issues that really close to me, to my heart, 
is the assassination of our first prime minister, because I'm originally from the DRC. Patrice Lumumba was assassinated in January 1961. And, and following his assassination, uh, there was a, a huge uproar here in, in the U.S. among the Black, the African-American community. As a matter of fact, on February the 15th, 1961, there was a very, very important demonstration at the U.N. in New York City. And that was a turning point in kind of galvanizing and radicalizing uh, the Black power movement in the United States. So I, I think that people of the Black Caucus, they really need to look at that legacy. African-Americans have always, uh, to a large degree, to a large extent, they have supported the African people, they have supported the African causes, they have supported the causes of African emancipation and African decolonization. So I am very saddened to see them, the, the Black Caucus actually being manipulated, you know, by the powers that be, uh, to turn their, their backs uh, against Africa. One thing that I really need to point out too, where actually the rubber meets the road, if you look closely at the resolution, you'll see that it's really not about Africa. It's not even about Russia. It's really about maintaining U.S. influence and U.S. Um, uh, interest in Africa. So it, it's really promoting and safeguarding those interests in Africa. And Telama a few minutes ago brought China. So I am actually wondering if this resolution is not a dress rehearsal for something actually larger and bigger that will take place against China's influence and China's footprint in, in Africa. So I am really just wondering because, you know, if you look at those two nations, China and, and, and Russia, the nation that really has a huge influence on Africa is actually China and not and not Russia. And I know that the U.S. is really trying to find a way to dislodge this kind of grip. I wouldn't call that a grip. I mean, this kind of influence that China is wielding on the African continent. So it might be just maybe a dress rehearsal for more military presence of the U.S. in Africa, maybe more financial and and um, and economic interest and investment in Africa to basically kind of counter the influence, the growing influence of, uh, of China. You know, that really brings up uh, this issue of conflicting policies and conflicting statements that are constantly made by the U.S. as it relates to Africa. To your point about maybe a shift in strategy or a dress rehearsal, there was a recent, uh, I believe it was a foreign policy article where uh, Secretary Blinken was quoted uh, and some other peripheral uh, officials in the U.S. saying, we're going to change our strategy. We're going to uh, pull away from military involvement and get involved mm -hmm. with economic development. But I'm very cynical that that is true. Uh, just a few months ago, the Biden administration sent hundreds of U.S. troops to Somalia, Somalia reversing former yeah. President Trump's withdrawal. That does not suggest to me uh, that is uh, you're moving away or they're moving away from military presence. Mm -hmm. There's no indication that those troops have moved uh, since they were sent there in May. Uh, and so it just seems to be a lot of lip service. And my concern is it's, it's, it, this is a case of the tiger will never change its stripes. You know, they'll say whatever it is they need to say, but they'll ultimately underestimate the power that's on the African continent, the consciousness that is uh, rising on, on the African continent. I want to uh, get your response, uh, Didier, on, on a point you made about some of these uh, African-American Congress people that are that are pushing certain um, anti-Africa mm. bills. You use the word manipulate, ironically, that was also... <laughs> exactly. 7311. But it does bring up a question. Is this a matter of them just not knowing? Really, a lot of people don't know about what goes on in Africa. I mean, even Africans and uh, sometimes don't know, uh, at least about their neighboring countries. They might know about yeah. their particular country, yeah. but they might have a, a, a warped idea of what's happening next door because they're reading it in the CNN mm -hmm. and the New York Times or whatever they may be. So this is, you know, somewhat speculation. But do you think this is a matter of them just kind of largely being ignorant and being manipulated, or are they just knowingly doing what they're doing? Well, Hermela, when you are telling me that Congresswoman Karen Bass was not even aware that she was a co-sponsor of that bill, it really worries me, you know? So I'm wondering, you know, do they document themselves? I mean, do they, do they know what's going on on the African continent? Do they know 
uh, what position to take vis-a-vis -vis Africa. Uh, so it, it, it's really a sad uh, state of affair. And, uh, and, and I would basically just call the Black Caucus to, I mean, it used to be a time when Black Caucus would actually send a delegation to Africa to find out more about the countries, you know, and then they would tour different African countries. I mean, I wonder if they shouldn't do that even more often to really get a, get familiarized with what's going on in Africa on the ground instead of uh, promoting a bill that's uh, manifestly against uh, Africa's uh, best interest. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have to agree with you that that moment with Congresswoman Karen Bass, it just felt like one of those things that, you know, their aides are just putting their names on things mm -hmm. that they don't necessarily know are on there, which I think is true in general for a lot of policies, but it's just shocking when it's something of this magnitude that yeah. really puts into question whether freedom of speech uh, is being um, uh, is, is being respected. There's a comment that, Taylor, I want you to respond to. Ja Jira said, uh, you know, ask these gentlemen, and, and I'll give both of you a chance uh, to respond. Uh, on their opinion on what African governments can do to exploit this great power competition to African interests. Clearly, you know, this Blinken trip comes less than two weeks after Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov very much being clear about, you know, African countries standing up uh, to colonialism and, and, and respecting the sovereignty. The kind of speech that we would never imagine a U.S. official uh, mm. could make, you know, take that uh, um, as you may. But is there a moment here? Do you guys see a moment for African countries to kind of use this power struggle to their own advantage for the sake of their people, you know, for for the sake of sort of getting out of the chains of this neo-colonialism that has just become so much more blatant uh, I think in the last several years, hey, Lama. Well, that's actually uh, the biggest concern that we have. There's uh, currently a new scramble that is taking place on the continent of Africa. The first scramble, 1884, Africans were not at the table. In fact, we remember the uh, the statement, the quotation from the King Leopold II, the second, who says, "Well, I want to have a peace." of this magnificent, magnificent African, African cake. Currently, as you and I are talking, there's a new scramble on the continent. And this time, Africans can be part of the process. But our problem is the leadership. Our problem is, for instance, when we look at in the case of Ethiopia, right, instead of us understanding that there are bigger fish that we need to fry, we're fighting among each other. Our problem is that too many of our African countries still have uh, puppets from the, for the West. They are there, sustained by the West to do the interest of the rest. Currently, there's a new scramble. Here are the numbers. 90% of the world platinum supply comes from Africa. Colton, the same, the same number, at that 70%. Cobalt, all of it, we have so much natural resources on the continent of Africa. Everybody is not coming because they love us. They're coming because of our natural resources. So it's really the time for us to have good leadership in position of power so that we can make the proper decision. Because the biggest issue that we might face, right, just like our founding fathers, right, they face colonization. And we can be proud of the fact that Ethiopia was the nation that defeated the Italian that's never been colonized. But right now, there is also a sense for us to play a role for the future generations. And but right now, in this race of rally, we have dropped the baton for so many African countries. We have failed to basically take in charge of the challenges that we are facing. So therefore, we are not prepared to tackle that new scramble of the continent of Africa that is taking place because we are too busy fighting among each other, because we are too busy of some of our African countries stealing billions of dollars to place them in France or any other type of European uh, places while our people are suffering, right? So we have puppet in position of power. So yes, it's a great time for us 
Uh, but I am not so sure that we are able right now because of our fell leadership that is incapable of understanding that the biggest enemy, the biggest challenges for us is not you, brother who's Tigre or Amara, who is not Yoruba or uh, Yoruba and Ausa or in Congo Brazzaville, Moshi or Congo. It's, it's the fact that our continent are so rich and everybody is coming. And they're not coming because they love us. They're coming for their own personal interest. So we need to protect our interest. We need to have leaders that are interested in protecting the interest of the people. But that's not what we have for the most part. We have people who are stealing billions of dollars in our African countries. Basically, the same way as years ago, and Didier is more qualified than me to talk about this, when the slave trade took place, some kings, I believe, were part of the process of selling their own people, right? The same process is still in place. We are not selling our people. We are selling our natural resources. And you know what? Some of us, right, are receiving the millions of dollars for our family, our kids, and then the whole country is falling apart because those resources are not being beneficial for the people of that country. And so as long as we are facing that, we have a problem. And we, the diaspora, that's why I encourage you in the work that you're doing. We are the one who can put pressure on the U.S. government and put pressure on the local government in our African country so that we have the qualified, better leadership that can make the decisions for the young generations that are coming. That's why I want to stop at that point. And Didier, before you answer this question, I want to present another layer because you are an African history uh, expert and professor. Uh, so first question is, how can the African continent actually, you know, capitalize, for lack of a better wor word, uh, uh, on this competition? But another layer is, you know, as someone who knows African history well, how how aware are people that you meet that are from the African continent about their own story or the accurate versions of their own country story or the countries around them? And I imagine uh, that it's really frustrating for you to watch how warped people's ideas yeah. and stories of their own countries, let mm -hmm. alone their neighbors are. So mm -hmm. how, where do you see the consciousness at this point and, and has mm -hmm. it changed over the years? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Two very good questions. One from one of the viewers and then your last question about the consciousness of African people, consciousness of about their plight, consciousness about the solutions also, the challenges and the solutions. To the first question, I think that Telama really provided a very good answer. It's a problem of leadership. And, um, you know, if... Uh, the competition between Russia and the U.S. and China going to turn into a new Cold War, then we have the answer. We know that during the Cold War, African governments and African leaders were not really able to play out one uh, superpower against the other superpower for the benefit of their countries. It was impossible because they were basically uh, in the pocket of some of the, 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 the financial uh, uh, multinationals and Western governments and so on. They weren't really working for the interests of the people, but for their own interests. I think that the, the biggest problem tied with this problem of leadership is accountability. Are you accountable to your people who elected you as president? Or are you accountable to foreign governments who actually helped you uh, read the elections and, and, and have the power that you have? So that's, to me, that's the biggest problem, is the problem of accountability. A country such as South Africa has the economy, has the might, has the democratic, democratic system to actually stand uh, its ground against Blinken, against the U.S., and have a minister say, no, you are not allowed to bully us. You cannot bully us. You know, enough is enough. But do we have other African leaders and governments can actually do the same? Probably not. The other issue is the issue of Pan-Africanism, I think. I mean, the African Union is a very, very weak entity. It's a very, very weak institution. I think that the answer to the, the first question is maybe bolster this idea. And actually, this is also kind of killing two birds with one stone, responding to your question as well, Hermela. I think that it's really that consciousness of being an African before being a, 
a Congolese or being somebody from Gabon or Ethiopia, if we have that Pan-African uh, consciousness, if we can recapture the Pan-African ideal of people like Kwame Nkrumah and Marcus Garvey and all of those people, Patrice Lumumba, that really fought hard, you know, for the Pan-African ideal to be promoted, you know, maybe we can actually start providing some solutions to our problem, solutions that will be African solutions to African problem. Because more often than not, what happens is that we are looking for foreigners to solve our own problems. And that has been kind of a leitmotif, a very recurrent leitmotif uh, in Africa, in the consciousness of African people on the African continent, as well as on the diaspora, waiting for solutions to come from abroad, to come from other people, even though we know that those people have spent centuries actually uh, pillaging Africa, uh, creating and establishing policies that are at the detriment of the African continent. I mean, it, it, it's it's like, a, you know, wanting solution and asking solution from the person that's victimizing you. It's really counterintuitive, but that's actually the mindset of many African leaders and many African people, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I mean, I think Ethiopia is a really good example of some folks, including myself. I was completely thrown, uh, I was misled, I should say, mm. you know, reading mm. the story of the conflict in the beginning, mm. you know, both of my families from uh, Tigray, but having very much Ethiopian sensibilities, never really mm. buying into the ethnicity element, but also as a journalist, not realizing how off actually uh, certain networks like CNN and New York Times were. I just couldn't believe, even though I was in it and and, and I've, I've seen, you know, bias and all of that stuff. I just couldn't believe that the stories were as wrong as they were. I thought they would be a little more, more sophisticated in the way that they lied about these stories. And, and I'm going to present uh, just one more question to you, Didier, about because I'm, I, I'm glad you brought up the issue of the African Union. I mean, there's so many institutions like the UN, like the African Union, that are supposed to be there to bring some balance to the exactly. world. Exactly. But they're not. And, and I actually have some empathy for some folks, for example, that support the TPLF now designated terrorist mm. organization in Ethiopia, mm. that were ethno fascists you know, so divisive in the country for as long as that they uh, ran it. I, in some ways, I empathize for the people that sort of support their narrative because they cannot imagine a world where the UN, where the African Union, where the New York Times, where the CNN and all of these institutions that claim to be these credible sources are all lying about this conflict. And in some ways they're optimistic. They just cannot mm -hmm. imagine such a sinister world. So uh, my question to you, Didier, is, you know, what do you make of this sort of sophisticated apparatus of colonialism and how much more difficult does that make it than maybe a time where it was just brute force? Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a very good question. I think that the, the the resources are not on our side. That's really the big issue. It's the resources, but it's also the termination, it's the mind, it's the resolve. Um, that actually not on our side, but on the other side. So take the the, the African Union for for instance. You know, let's just go back to that. So we have this HR seventy three eleven that was voted unanimously by the U.S. House of Representatives. Now I know that there are actually there were two readings at the Senate, and then it's now going to the Foreign Affairs Commission or Foreign, Foreign Relations Committee of the Senate uh, to be examined, and then it's gonna go back to the US Senate to be, uh, to be approved. And if we don't do anything, it's gonna be approved again on, the, again on the bipartisan basis. So my question is that why just leave South Africa as the lone voice to counter this uh, resolution? Why not have the African Union could have a counter resolution against HR 7311. That, that's the question. Why not? Why can we unite when we see that the interest of African countries is to go against a resolution that's patronizing, that's condescending, that basically promotes the interests of the US, uh, uh, 
at the detriment of the interests of African countries. Why not do that? So we are dealing again, going back to Telema's point, with weak leadership and weak institutions. Uh, the, the, the African Union is a very weak institution that actually lacks the resources. I, I read somewhere, and this has to be verified and confirmed, that a big chunk of the budget, the running budget of the African Union is actually coming from the European Union, which actually is just mind boggling. So, so there is no will, there's no willpower, there's no determination, there is no resolve. And we are, we are basically leaderless, you know, we have poor leadership and that's the great problem that we are facing. Yes, uh, you know, one caveat I'll say to that, and of course things can change over time, but the current Ethiopian prime minister appears to be a little bit different in that case, which is why he is so viciously attacked on the world stage. You know, he did get the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for creating peace with Eritrea, which was at a Cold War yeah. in, a sense, in Ethiopia for a long time because of this ethno-fascist leadership, the Tigray People's Liberation Front. They got out of the picture and all of a sudden Ethiopia and Eritrea could get along. I mean, these are countries that fought this border war um, in, in 1998 that killed over probably 200,000 people when you consider both sides. So uh, it, they gave him the, the Nobel Peace Prize for that. But when the alliance in the horn started to strengthen and there was a sense that the U.S. was not going to be in control the way that they were in the horn under the TPLF leadership, there was all of this, you know, smearing campaign called him a genocider. Mm -hmm. Mm. trying to wipe out all ethnic Tigrayans, leaving out the fact that the TPLF actually attacked a national army base, killing uh, so many soldiers. And that's how the war started, which admitted by Senator uh, Chris Coons of Delaware, but kind of as a, you know, a little bit of a, just like a, a footnote, as if that's not the, uh, what the entire conflict is centered on. And so because mm. the TPLF is a reliable uh, proxy uh, of, of the U.S., they been pushing uh, their narrative, which goes back to narrative uh, uh, for a very long time. So even when there is good leadership, there's just so much that works against that leader uh, and the country. And some of that is its own citizens that have bought into the story that uh, the U.S. is telling. So Taylama, this whole concept or right, reality, really, of all of these different institutions, African Union, UN, uh, European Union, all seemingly the same entity in a sense uh you know how difficult do you have you found it is to explain to people from the african continent or african diaspora about the way this works or is everyone around you uh pretty conscious in the way that they understand the stories out of africa well i think uh everybody understand that the african union is the result of uh well, it's an, an institution that is there, but when Didier is telling us that, and we know that for a fact that it's financed by uh, the European Union, right? Once you, somebody else control your finances, they control you and what you're going to say. I don't know if you remember not too long ago, there was a lady here, I forgot his name. She was the ambassador of the African Union in the United States. Um, and she was being vocal in some of the injustices that were taking place on the continent of Africa. In fact, uh, she was very um, objective vis-a-vis -vis to the French and how the policy has been so destructive on the continent of Africa. She didn't last long. They kicked her out, right? So my point is mm -hmm. that uh, that is just to tell you that as leadership is a key, and, and, and you mentioned you can treat Ethiopia uh, I mean, for us, uh, because of the situations, the historical si historical situations that we're facing, we, we have a lot of challenges. It's going to take more for us to, uh, to, to, to fight, uh, to find our ways uh, for the development of the continent of Africa. It's going to request a lot of resol resolve. And so, as you mentioned, your country, uh, Ethiopia, I, I just uh, want to take this opportunity to say that it, it's very depressing to see how uh, in the country that has been uh, the only country to survive colonization now, it has basically, as a friend of mine told me recently, it has been to a point where it has self-colonized. Uh, uh, the ethnic federalism, 
the reality is that ethnic federalism uh, is uh, homeomorphic to uh, colonization. There's a one-to-one -one, uh, 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 on the consequences of what colonization does into a country and what ethnic federalism can do into a country. There's a one-to-one -one map. The consequences would be the same, right? We were under the influence on the countries that were colonized under the influence of the divide and conquer philosophy. Uh, and, and what you see as you look at the situation in Ethiopia is a divide and conquer uh, that is was self-imposed by Ethiopians themselves, right? Because you have created this uh, state based on different tribal uh, and, and tribal uh, ethnicity. And so once that is done, you have basically destroyed the fabric that could have made Ethiopia strong when, when, when Ethiopia fought uh, against the Italians during the, uh, the Adwa, Adwa War. It was not one tribe that came together to fight the, uh, the, 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 the Italians. It were all the Amara, the Tigray, the Walaita, and all the groups, they came together to stand for the sovereignty and the freedom of the nation of Ethiopia. So once you now break that by creating some subdivisions of tribal president, then you've destroyed and you have infested that nation with a poison that is destructive. And if Ethiopians do not, Ethiopians leaders, I'm saying, do not overcome and come to a negotiation table for the greater of Ethiopia, well, what we can see is a country that is falling apart, right? And just like other African countries, when I'm looking at Ethiopia today, it seems to me that it looks like a colonized people. But my point is that at the end of the day, leadership is the key because it was a set of leaders that created ethnic federalism in Ethiopia. So just like all the other leaders that, the other leaders that we have had in other African countries, why we're not able to, to remain because they were kicked out from the colonial power. So yes, leadership is not gonna solve the, all the problems, but it's a great start to have the right people in the right position to lead the nation. People are working to serve something greater than their self-interest. That is basically what we need on the continent of Africa. Absolutely. To your point, you know, leadership is important, but the way that everybody reacts to that leadership and is willing to be led is also really important. I'm glad you brought up ethnic federalism in Ethiopia. It's a very, uh, it's, it's, it's a very emotionally charged issue because it has kind of done what colonialism would have done uh, mm. and institutionalized mm. it. And mm. now there's a lot of unlearning that has to happen. I read somewhere that one of the most important forms of learning is unlearning. That is having to happen with the people. I do tend mm. to be uh, optimistic in uh, what goes on in Ethiopia because majority of the country has rejected this ethno-fascist entity, the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Uh, but there's still a lot of trauma uh, that has been in place for the last 20 plus years, a lot of injustice that needs to be um, righted uh, for it to actually work. I mean, it's a huge country. It's a country of, country of 110 million people. So mm -hmm. definitely the work is uh, cut out for the people. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's, Didier, I want to uh, go to you a little bit, and, and I do want Taylor, uh, for you to answer this also. What should we be doing next? I mean, 7311 has challenged what we're willing to take. Absolutely. You know, if we sit back and just allow it, um, it just really signals to them they can pretty much do anything. I, I don't exactly. know what more you can do but criminalize basically dissenting voices of, of, of um, African people. So what do we do next? I think we need to keep pushing uh, because as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the bill now or the resolution now is on the Senate floor. Uh, there were two readings. Uh, it now actually sits uh, somewhere uh, at, a, at some desk uh, uh, of the Foreign Relations Committee of the Senate, which actually means that they're going to be examining that because those people are actually the specialist, quote unquote. And then after that, it's going to come back to the 100 uh, senators to uh, debate, to discuss, and uh, to vote. So I am actually, as I said at the very onset, at the very beginning of this conversation, I was really happy to hear that uh, Blinken is actually softening uh, the U.S. position and saying that the U.S. is not in the business of dictating uh, um, Africa what to do. Uh, I think the whole mindset that 
our enemies are your enemies has to be gone. You know, we, uh, we have our own interests as African people. So right now, what we are asking people to do, the petition uh, that uh, Telama actually came up with, the petition, the petition going to be probably posted, I think, on change.org for people to sign and people can actually get in touch with their representatives, uh, with their senators, you know, to basically tell them that enough is enough. Africa cannot be bullied. We have our own interests. We have our own mind. We can actually make our own decisions. We are not children. And, you know, I mean, uh, people need to understand that it's not only African governments or African people on the African continent that are targeted that can actually be sanctioned be, be because, you know, they, they are associated with, the, with Russian people. But it's also people... Uh, of the African diaspora, including in the United States of America. So we are also the target of that. So that's why what we are saying is that there is the petition, read it, um, uh, endorse it, sign it, and uh, uh, send it to your representatives, send it to your local representatives and to your senators and tell them that uh, you have taken a stand you want Africa to be respected, and you do not want to set this to set a precedent. Because if we let this go, if it passes the Senate, if it ends up on the desk of the, the President of the United States, uh, uh, Joe Biden, to sign, that means that uh, there is a precedent and the U.S. House can actually, the House of Representatives can actually come up with a several bill that will actually follow the same path. We have to stop it. And uh, it's not just uh, uh, African intellectuals that can stop it or African scholars. It's actually everyday people, you know, regular people. You read it, it's in a plain English language. And then you'll see that uh, this is something that definitely you need to push and approve and endorse and send to your representatives, as I said. Absolutely. I think that's a really good point. Uh, the former, uh, the late, I should say, Ethiopian uh, emperor. It's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. Yeah, it's just past the House and it's going to the Senate. Um, uh, the, the, the late uh, Ethiopian uh, Emperor Haile Selassie before uh, the League of Nations, before World War II started, uh, was addressing the League of Nations, saying it's us today, it'll be you tomorrow, basically saying, you know, when you guys say nothing, when the African continent is being attacked, there's going to be a time where it's you. And so I think this is like a really important point to make for those who are just Americans in general. Many of us, like I said, are Americans. And the fact that we cannot take part in influencing or manipulating opinions no. that are actually no. impacting the African continent, you know, impacting uh, uh, places where we have family, where sanctions are in place, um, you know, as the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. made it comfortably clear that if, if the continent buys anything other than food and fertilizer, uh, then it is going to be uh, sanctioned. So, Taylama, your this this petition is your uh, brainchild. You know, what should people know? Um, how do they engage with it? I know Didier might have covered some of it, but I just want to give you a chance to kind of give us your perspective on that. First of all, Didier is not being very honest by saying it's my petition because both of us were talking about it. We've been talking and Didier was the one who says, let's start a petition. So it's, it's both of us ideas. Um, I, I think, uh, look, what it shows us that is that here are the facts. Among all the immigrants that come into the United States, Africans tend to be the most educated ones but we are the least structured and organized. In order to face the issue that we're facing in the American politics, we have to be structured and organized and go after this kind of uh, situation when they happen. I am glad that there have been some structured and I've seen some Nigerian have some structured. Now I see APAC, right? The, American Ethiopian uh, pact that has been in place, and now that is putting a lot of pressure on the politicians. That is how the American political system works. Because today we are facing this petition, but tomorrow I guarantee you there's going to be something else. Mm -hmm. Because the prejudices against Africans are deeply seated in the fabrics of the brain of people. 
And if in our own self we are impacted and infected deeply in our consciousness, right? There's that double consciousness where you have been so miseducated about Africans that things goes and nobody talk about it. So if Africans get to register, to restructure themselves, get organized, then when something like this happens, we can all write a letter. We can act upon putting pressure so that it can be stopped, right? I remember a few years ago, Hillary Clinton was running for um, a senator of New York when she was running for senator. She made a comment uh, in New York on Arafat's, a uh, former PLO president, Arafat's wife. I don't remember exactly what the comment was. But the Jewish community in New York put so much pressure on her that she retracted that comment a few days later. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. And as long as we're going to continue to sleep and just uh, be dormant in this country, people are not going to respect us. We have to impose respect. Respect is not, you don't beg for respect, you impose respect. Today we are all respecting China, but 50 years ago China was a very poor country. But because it has imposed itself, it has imposed its will, now everybody, all of us are trying to learn Chinese. That's the same thing we need to do. Africans need to stand for themselves. Those who are here, we need to be structured as you guys are doing. Uh, with uh, the chairman, Ms. Fene of the APAC, we've mentioned, we talked about creating a, a, a Pan-African park. Right? That's one of the solutions that we can provide so that those things don't happen. They don't call our countries just like the former president did without having consequences. They don't call, they don't declare, go bomb the dumb, uh, the, the dumb uh, of Ethiopia. So there's no consequences. If we are structured, those things will not happen. So at the end of the day, it comes, it boils down to how, what are our efforts? Are we coming together as one group, as one people to fight mm -hmm. against the prejudices our continent are facing? If we don't do that, we all we're going to be in the bottom of the scale. Romela, if I may add something very, very quickly, very briefly, I just really want your viewers to know, to understand that we're not pro-Russians. All right. Our stand is not in favor of Russia. We are pro-Africans and we are pro, uh, we are Pan-Africans, Pan-Africanists, and we are, we are not uh, trying to promote the interests of Russia against the interests of the United States. We also are American citizens. So I really invite the people who actually followed us for about an hour now to go read H.R. 7311. It's not a long document. It's maybe like a three-page document. I know that you put some excerpts, you know, on, uh, on the screen. It's a fairly uh, short document uh, in plain English. And I also like the people, invite the people to read the petition when it actually going to be posted on change.org uh, and, and, and then to make their choice, you know. But if you support this petition, it doesn't mean that you are pro-Russian. Uh, it means that you are pro-African, pan-Africanist, and then you do your job as an American citizen, as a patriot American citizen. Absolutely, I yeah. I think Africa is saying... This has nothing to do with us. So stop dragging us into exactly. it. You know, we're not, just like the South African uh, minister said, we're not pro-war. In fact, we hate war. We know the damage and untold stories uh, that, that, that it creates. And so we're not for it. And we want diplomatic uh, solution to this as quickly as possible. Stop dragging us into this is really the point that it's making. And same is true, I think, for much of the, the, the African diaspora. Um, I hope you guys will join us in the Twitter space so that people can ask you questions directly. Sure. One of those questions, uh, and, and I'll post the Twitter space on my page at Hermela TV for anyone who's interested in joining and mm -hmm. asking questions. One of the questions I do want you in particular to ask the air is what pan-Africanism means to you and how you would define it as an African history professor? Because I think that is something that couldn't be defined enough because sometimes people think it only applies mm -hmm. to people on the African continent and it's exclusive when really it's actually much more broad and just than that. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time and for joining me and for you know leading this conversation on what is 
uh, a really disturbing um, bill that has passed the U.S. House and is now being uh, deliberated in the U.S. Senate. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys on Twitter space uh, and hopefully we'll do this more. Thank you for Thank having you. us, Romela. My pleasure. We'll do this again. Okay. okay. Bye. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad that uh, Se uh, Secretary Blinken has confirmed that America is not asking us to choose. I don't recall uh, any attempt by the United States to do that. But in terms of our interaction with some of our partners in Europe and elsewhere, there has been a sense of a patronizing bullying uh, toward you choose this or else. Uh, and uh, the recent uh, legislation passed in the United States of America uh, by the House of Representatives, we found a most unfortunate bill uh, that we'd hope the media would say more about because uh, when we believe in freedom, as I'm saying, it's freedom for everybody. You can't say because Africa is doing this, you will then be punished by the United States. So uh, that's been a disappointing uh, uh, passage of legislation by one house and we hope the other house will not agree to uh, such offensive legislation.